And so I'm going to apologize. My voice is kind of shot at this point. I'm Jim Nettles. Um, I do a lot of different stuff, um, but amongst everything else, I'm a writer. I do science fiction, fantasy, horror, contemporary, but stuff. I do a lot of nonfiction. I do a lot of writing, privacy, data security, business, a whole ton of stuff. And there's a whole ton of other things I'm in the middle of, um, some of which may come up during this conversation. Um, I work also very heavily in business and technology consulting, partner in a number of things. So IP is a large chunk of my life. Um, we did an IP panel last night talking about a lot of it. This is going to be a very targeted conversation until Courtney gets started and goes wherever. But <laughs> I'd like to ask. I think of the authors. Um, I'd like to ask my panelists to please introduce themselves. Uh, Matthew Lane, Senior Policy Counsel at Fight for the Future. Well, that's very succinct. What do you do exactly, Matt? Uh, I do a little bit of everything. So, uh, Fight for the Future <laughs> is a, uh, <laughs> an activist organization that fights for uh, internet rights and technology rights. Um, and we are involved in everything from privacy to First Amendment issues to uh, a lot of um, Operate IP issues uh, surrounding the use of information. Okay, Courtney. <laughs> and, and so I can talk for the rest of the hour, right? Okay, I'm just going to go get something else to drink. <laughs> I'm Courtney Lytle. I'm a partner at Colhane Meadows, and I teach as an adjunct at Emory Law School. I practice in the transactional area, in IP mostly, but also in general business stuff. Copyright is my main specialty. I teach in that and I practice in that and I tend to represent authors and publishers and other content creators. Cool. Uh, I'm Meredith Rose, Senior Policy Counsel of Public Knowledge. You've probably run into me on one of the six panels that I've done before this. Um, I uh, handle our intellectual property portfolio. Uh, Public Knowledge is a Washington, D.C.-based consumer advocacy organization, and we work on a wide range of tech-related policies, mostly at the federal level, um, everything from net neutrality to copyright um, to privacy to antitrust and competition policy. You name it, we've probably worked on it at some point. And I'm Mitch Stoltz. I'm the IP litigation director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I also lead our competition policy working group. EFF is a San Francisco-based uh, donor-supported nonprofit. Uh, we work to ensure the technology supports freedom, justice, and innovation for all. Um, and I am very happy to be here. So this is really to get in and talk about public domain and public domain works. Um, and we'll probably talk about some of the things that, that get squishy around the outsides of fair use as well. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the nice, fun things that happened last year was that the the House of Mouse finally had to give up and allow the mouse to begin to enter the public domain despite their best resistance. Which is why we now have, you know, a Mickey Mouse horror movie and a Mickey Mouse, you know, shooter game and a few other fun things along those lines. Um, but so again, when things enter the public domain, this is an interesting balance between rights of creator and the rights of the public and the, you know, the cultural value of work that gets created. You know, for example, for a very long time, if we look at things like um, Sherlock Holmes, half of it was in the public domain. The other half was not. That's why you would see Sherlock Holmes mysteries and things like that do series up to a point and stop was because. Well, the, the, the estate was not always friendly and was a bit challenging on sometimes licensing some of those properties to do things with. Um, and again, that's the, the choice of the, of the foundation. Um, so I just want to kind of start with that notion for everybody of where do you land in terms of public domain? How do you, how, where do you land in terms of your thoughts on IP rights and how that goes? So the public domain slaps. Um, <laughs> yeah, public domain rules. Uh, so the thing about the public domain is fundamentally the way something gets into the public domain is it ages out of copyright protection. Um, on a technical, you're a really annoying IP lawyer like I am. 
Um, so that is going to be, uh, there's different lengths of copyright protection, kind of depending on what you're talking about. Um, like sound recordings have a totally different term of protection, uh, like legacy sound recordings than most other things do. As a general rule of thumb, everything other than a sound recording, 95 years. 95 years after the date it was released, recorded, it's in the public domain. Uh, sound recordings, it's 100 years. I'm not going to get into the reason behind that. It has to do with a bill that was passed in 2018. Prior to that, there was no public domain in sound recordings, period. Um, the idea of the public domain is that, you know, access to works and the ability to comment on them to uh, make something new out of them is, like, very fundamental to our freedom of speech. Um, and there are lots of limitations and exceptions baked into copyright law for things that are under protection, but they are still fundamentally kind of, you know, little finicky things that you have to go through four step tests, multi factors, or you have to be a library and then you get some stuff and not others. Um, public domain is just you're free and clear. Um, you can do what you like with it. Now, within the bounds of copyright law, there can be some other stuff that can come in and cause some problems for you, like trademarks, which I'm sure we're going to get into at some point. Um, but the cool thing about the public domain is like it is truly free to use. So uh, Steamboat Willie, famously now in the public domain. Um, the character of Mickey Mouse, not as much, just Steamboat Willie specifically is in the public domain. Uh, now we've got Winnie the Pooh. But Winnie the Pooh as a character, not necessarily as illustrated by the early books, it can get a little, it can get a little wacky. Um, and, uh, you know, as James mentioned earlier, you had a situation with Sherlock Holmes. So um, who here watched Enola Holmes, the Netflix movie? Uh, are you guys familiar with the lawsuit around it? Yeah, so I said, I was like, who's nodding vigorously in a tidy? Um, the IP litigator in the back. Um, <laughs> So one of the cool things, uh, and so as James mentioned, you know, because the public domain is a rolling date, um, it is fundamentally 95 years from the date of creation. That was frozen for a very long time. Nothing entered the public domain for about 20 years between like 1998 and 2018. Um, the end result of this was you had half of the Conan Doyle estate was in the public domain and the other half was still under copyright protection. And the question became, well, if you want to do a Sherlock Holmes, something new with Sherlock Holmes, what can you use and what can't you use? Uh, and the answer is, what can you use? You can use stuff that's in the public domain. You can't use stuff that is not in the public domain. And so the folks who created Enola Holmes, Enola Holmes is a, was an original character, um, you know, totally new adventure, was not in the Conan Doyle writings. Uh, the Conan Doyle estate came after the producers of the movie and said, actually, your version of Sherlock Holmes infringes on the version that's still under copyright. And their reasoning was that the Sherlock Holmes in Enola Holmes had feelings. Not making this up, had feelings and thought of women as people. Um, and therefore, that was based on the later Sherlock Holmes that was still under copyright protection. So the fact that you have this sort of rolling target of what's in the public domain and what is not can lead to these kind of wild situations where you have, like, you know, collective bodies of works that are split down the middle. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah. One of the things that's important, in, in my mind at least, for thinking about the public domain is that copyright law is based on the, it's authorized in the Constitution, the entire purpose of our statutory setup for copyright law is to encourage the production of works, both real sciencey stuff and patents and copyrights that we talk about, to encourage the production. And the way that you encourage the production is you incentivize it. So we are, so it, the government through the statutes is reserving to authors a, a limited monopoly is the term we use over the works they create. Usually we naturally think about copyright as, you know, I wrote this book, I drew this picture, therefore it's mine. In some countries that's true and ours not so much. The entire, the entire thing is statutory. The rights come from the government, which is not generally true, but in this case, it absolutely is. And the whole idea is to, give enough economic incentive to authors and artists to encourage them and allow them to create. So, but with the purpose of the creation eventually being in the public domain. The act prior to 1978, 76 act took effect in 78. So if you hear me talk about 76, it's 78. The 1909 act was the previous 
Act, that's the reason that we have the situation that Meredith just described, where some works are in the public domain and some are not, because each work started a fixed term of years at its state of publication. So if you wrote a few great novels, you kept up with your publication dates pretty well. If you were writing short stories or lots of illustrations, you never had any clue what was going on with your works. But with the 76 Act, we have changed the way we measure the term. It's the life of the author plus 70. So, so if I wrote 500 novels, all of them would fall into the public domain the exact same day. That's going to be a lot easier because right now you have to figure out when was this exact work published. And then there's a whole lot of buzz. You know, was it renewed? Was it not renewed? And things along those lines. Then you have to go get to each extension. And I love making exam questions about this. And, you know, blood comes out of my students' eyes. So it's fabulous. But... When, what we're talking about with Winnie the Pooh and with Steamboat Willie, all of that's under the 09 Act. So it's that fixed period of years. Yeah, and the flip side of the like, so most commonly you often hear copyright terms for something that is created today is life of the author plus 70 years. Um, that can vary a little bit depending on where you, I think Canada actually just moved up to life 70. They There's like plus 50 for a while. Um, and that's, again, super wobbly. Don't ever read the Copyright Act for funsies. Um, that will make your brain bleed out your ears. I do. Um, well, we're a special breed. Um, you know, the flip side of that. So one of the nice things is life plus 70 means when the author dies, you know, you, you start the clock. 70 years, go. It's it's technically 70 years and then the following January 1st. Um, so you don't need to know the exact, it's not like the exact date, like I actually died on November 2nd. So November 3rd, 70 years from now, it's the following January 1st. Um, the flip side of that is that there is a real problem, especially among older works, what we call the orphan works problem, um, which is that we do not know who owns the rights to things 70 years after their creator has died. Sometimes we don't know who owns the rights to something while their creator is still alive, uh, let alone following it through like, you know, who are their heirs? Uh, did they have heirs? Did they have a will at all? Uh, it, it's a huge, big open question. So in some ways, the flat 95 is like, easier enough to compute because I know when this thing was published, I can look that up. Um, and then you can, you know, say, oh, 95 years from now, plus January 1st, you're done. Um, Life plus 70 makes intuitive sense. It's great because you get an entire corpus of work that goes in at once, but it does lead to these weird orphan works problems. The issue with the Conan Doyle works, for instance, that Meredith was talking about, when you have to try to figure out what is in the public domain and what isn't, it's not just a matter of knowing when the publication date was. Some of the uncertainty that probably led to that lawsuit is that when you copyright a work, you have the rights to that work. And since the whole point of this is to protect the author's rights, these rights are important. If the author writes a sequel, it's called a derivative work. It's one of the exclusive rights in the statute. So the author has the exclusive right to make derivative works. These derivative works, though, don't get the whole full treatment that the first novel did. So if I write the second Sherlock Holmes book, I'm not extending the copyright from the first one. I'm only getting a copyright in what I have added. So if the character develops over the course of years, and this would be why the argument from the estate's not quite as insane as it sounds, is that if in the early book, Sherlock Holmes did not think that women were human, and towards the end, he opened his brain a little bit, either through cocaine or otherwise, and decided that women are mostly human, that would be something that would be covered under one of the later works. Let's be honest here, though. The question is, did he consider anyone human? Okay, there's that. Or he wasn't, so he probably considered us human but inferior. But the, but the important distinction is that the derivative work, the second work, the third work, the fourth work, the only thing that's protected under that one is what you have added that's new. And that's something that's going to be coming up when we talk about Steamboat Willie, because you'll say, woohoo, Mickey Mouse is in the public domain. He was whining when he was back. But Mickey Mouse isn't really in the public domain. Steamboat Willie is. Y'all have seen Steamboat Willie. It's kind of an unattractive rat. You can't use the mouse yet. You can use the unattractive rat. Mickey, Mickey Mouse comes later. And then Mickey Mouse, the version with the cute little voice we all recognize, came later than that. So depending on what of Mickey Mouse you want to use, it may not be in the public domain yet. It doesn't all fall in at once. It's gradual and knowing which bits come in when becomes challenging. So if you're thinking of using stuff that you think is public domain, 
it's worth making sure that you're correct and that you're not using stuff that's still protected or elements of that character that are still protected. All of these characters, all of these works that have sequels or anything that developed them over time are, you know, a little bit fragmented. And we have to make sure we're conscious of what is and what is not free to use. And that's one of the dangers of saying, woohoo, I can do anything with, with, with Mickey Mouse or with Winnie the Pooh. Meredith mentioned some of the illustrations, the cartoons we think of came later. Those aren't in the public domain yet. You can't use those images. You can use the stuff from the book. So Mitch, I know you've been trying to cut in for a few minutes. <laughs> well, is this a good time to start talking about trademark? I think it is. Yes. Well, yeah. Go for it. God help uh, us. Copyright and trademark are two different things, often confused. Trademark protects the name, logo, or appearance of something that you know, people use to identify it. And it started out as consumer protection. So if you go uh, into a store and, and you see a product and you see some distinctive feature of that product, be it the, be it the logo or, 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 or the name, or, or, or in, in, in rare cases, a, a, a color or something really distinctive to that manufacturer, uh, you know who it came from. Um, it's, of course, uh, like many things, mutated and, and, and gotten stronger and moved away from the, the consumer protection sort of rationale. But it, it's, it's both um, stronger and more limited than copyright. Stronger because it can potentially last forever. As long as somebody's selling a product or a service, uh, uh, they, can, they, they can have a trademark in the, uh, the, their logo, their name, or the, the distinctive elements of the product. It's not as strong in that it, it, it only protects uses that, that commercial uses that could lead to consumer confusion. I, um, so to take Mickey Mouse as an example, Mickey Mouse is obviously a Disney trademark. And in fact, I think they've been anticipating uh, Steamboat Willie going into the public domain for a little over a decade because the um, title card at the beginning of every Disney film for about the last decade has had a, a few frames of Steamboat Willie in it. Suggest to me they're trying to actually establish Steamboat Willie, the, the, the short film, as a trademark. Uh, I suspect I will, we'll, we'll see them arguing that in court in, in, the, in the coming years. Of, uh, I'm not sure. But, but Mickey, in the general sense, is also a logo for Disney. The hats, the, 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 you, know, you, see, you, you see his image places. So um, the, the way to avoid trademark problems, which again could potentially last forever, is using a character in a way that doesn't imply an association with the company. So it's not the mascot on your product, not um, um, something, anything that suggests an endorsement by Disney or or or, or, any, or or a connection with Disney. When you're doing parody, when you're when you're putting Mickey in a horror movie, or you're using Mickey in a you know in, to criticize Disney, this is, this is not a problem. Um, the problem. Oh well, we'll see. Yeah. So Matt. I want to rewind a little bit and go back to the original question, which was, I believe, uh, you know, what are our opinions on the public domain? Uh, amongst IP nerds, that can be a bit of a, a coded question, which is, how do you feel about a debate that's been raging pretty much since the uh, drafting of the Constitution? Ages. Yeah. And so um, the American system of IP, intellectual property, uh, was largely conceived, or at least most of the evidence shows, as a utilitarian system. So intellectual property, whether it be like inventions or art, is famously uh, labor-intensive and lengthy to create, but easy to copy. And so how do you uh, motivate people to do this? Society benefits from these things existing, but um, we need to find some way to pay them to motivate them. So there's a bit of a social contract here. And so the utilitarian nature is basically we are paying fair value for your creation and it's supposed to, you know, incentivize you, make you happy, make you want to work, make you comfortable, uh, allow you to pursue a career in a creative art. But the payment is the public domain. That's when the public gets it at the end of the term. That's when we get to use it. That's when we get to riff off of it, um, to do fun, silly things with it. Uh, a lot of art is built off of other art. Um, over the years, uh, this kind of thing has been a, a bit reinterpreted as uh, what about sort of moral rights, inherent rights, the rights of the artist, 
Uh, sometimes this is coded for the rights of the middlemen, the rights of the the copyright aggregators. Um, then, um, and it gets kind of tricky in modern age when we're actually seeing a lot of strategic corporate activity of how to keep things out of the public domain. How do we avoid the payment? And so personally, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of the public domain. I'm also a strong proponent of artists being able to make a living. <laughs> and I think those things uh, can live in harmony, but it requires us to kind of like go back to thinking of what, how do we pay artists? How do we motivate them to create? Like that's the entire point of the IP clause of the constitution um, that when it was uh, when it was drafted and where it is in the Constitution, the, the actual correct interpretation of the IP clause is that we're giving Congress the right to create this in, uh, very important policy because it is a federal problem. Um, the the actual potential impetus behind this, uh, Mark Limley was doing some research and found that in the Articles of Confederation days, uh, every state was allowed to issue their own patents. And so you had like three or four different inventors that all had overlapping steamboat patents. So talking about Steamboat Willie, I mean, it's another case where Steamboat... Very good segue. Man. Yeah, Very really, good. really, yeah. Yeah, so, oh, I would just want to throw one other thing in there. Sure. I swear we'll let you speak eventually, James. <laughs> no, um, I, if I really want to cut in, I can do that. Oh, you, yeah. I, we all, I, I, can, I can... We're all friendly enough with each other that we <laughs> throw elbows. Um, yeah, so the other thing to keep in mind is that um, uh, copyright terms over the years have obviously expanded, and they tend to be designed to accommodate the most valuable properties. The vast, vast majority of copyrighted works have basically, in a totally free economic market, a value of zero, I think about three years after they're first released. Um, Life plus 70 is truly for the Mickey Mouses of the world. Um, and if you think about, and keep in mind, copyright doesn't just apply to movies and music and books. It applies to software as well. So if anybody wants to crack at what, uh, you know, what Clippy is going to be worth 70 years <laughs> after, or like 95 years because he's a corporate work after his first introduction. So I don't know, 2080, we'll have a Clippy birthday. Uh, when Clippy's in the public domain, people are going to go ham. Um, yeah, if you've got a guess at what that's going to be worth, you know, feel free. Um, but this is a very, very long term, um, you know, and I talked a little bit earlier about the orphan works problem of what happens when you've got something that's technically locked down for that long and nobody can touch it while it sort of starts to slip into obscurity. There are some really interesting graphs. Um, the Internet Archive, obviously, like archives a ton of stuff in the public domain. Um, and they have done some really interesting research on books, the availability of books um, that were published over the course of the 20th century. And you can actually see, like, once you creep up to the public domain cutoff year, whatever that year is at any given time, you see, like, more and more and more and more. And then as soon as you hit the first year where something's still under copyright, it just bottoms out. Um, and once things roll into the public domain, they become available again. But there is a very large sort of archiving historical crisis that is caused by these very, very long terms, which aren't providing any reward for the vast majority of people that they and works that they apply to. Um, so you, once in a while, you'll hear so like um, uh, Tom Lehrer, who famously kind of if you're a fan of Tom Lehrer, uh, which we should all be. Yeah. If you're not, go look him up. Please go look him that. up. Because uh, we all go together when we go. Um, he he is old. He's very old now. I think he's in his 90s. Um, but I thought he, he was dead. Has he died? No. No. Oh, oh good. No, I'm he's immortal. Right. Okay, good. Don't, the world is better if he's still don't alive. Don't put that evil on him. Um, the the man, he, he invented the jello shot. Among his other many accomplishments, he claims to have invented the jello shot, and I will, I will choose to believe that it's true. Um... So anyway, so Tom Lehrer actually um, sort of very famously a couple of years ago dedicated all of his work to the public domain. He just said, it is, I am not going to collect royalties on this. Go forth. Everybody use my lyrics. Um, he couldn't dedicate the actual sound recordings because those are technically held by a label somewhere. So he couldn't do that. But he could dedicate the compositions and the lyrics to the public domain. Um, the problem is he actually can't do that. Um, copyright is automatic. Uh, and the statute does not care about whether you say it's in the public domain. It is technically still protected by copyright. Now, you can do funny things with, like, Creative Commons licenses. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, like Creative Commons licenses are basically you put out a contract that says by using my work, you agree to these sets of terms. Um, and one of them is basically you agree to have fun and do whatever you want. It's a CC0 license. And that's basically you making a promise that even though this is technically under copyright, under American law, I will not come at you for using it. Um, but we do have a situation where yeah, you can't, technically there's no mechanism formally under the statute to relinquish something prior to its expiration. Um, but people people find ways to try and do it anyway. So but with the notion of this panel, because it's to be about how do I use stuff that's in the public domain? And I'm going to set up kind of a, a case here that I have actually been a part of. So let's say that you are going to be part or you want to put together a book because I'm using a book, but whatever the work is. So I'm going to do Sherlock Holmes against, you know, insert your generic alien here, right? We're going to put Sherlock Holmes in space fighting aliens with his deductive reasoning because, you know, unlike the aliens from War of the Worlds, they can't be, you know, they can't be beaten with viruses, but a good mind twister screws them up. They just kind of all implode. So let's say I'm putting this story together. Cocaine kills them. Sleep deprivation <laughs> is a wonderful thing to come up with ideas. Oh, I actually, I actually do have a real life example of this. If you want it. Uh, oh, well, I want to get to okay, that in a minute. So, um, but so I want to go through this setup of I'm going to put this out, and I want to talk a little bit about. Yes, you can use it, but what do you need to do in that usage, and what will be yours that's protected? So let's say we put Sherlock Holmes and Watson in space against Ming the Merciless. Um, <laughs> uh, who here has read anything by Roger Zelazny? Okay, we got some non-zero number of hands. Rock and roll. Um, who here has read Night in a Lonesome October? Nope. God dang it. Okay. I have. Um, here's your homework assignment. Uh, go buy a copy of Night in a Lonesome October. It's the last book Zelazny wrote before he died. Um, it is a public domain monster mash. Uh, the story, I'm not going to give it away, but the story is told from the perspective of Jack the Ripper's dog. Uh, and there is a Lovecraftian horror that is about to descend upon the world and every like hundred years or so, and a bunch of public domain monsters all get together and there's some intrigue about who's on, who's trying to accelerate the horror and who's trying to stop it. So the characters are Jack the Ripper, Dracula, uh, early Sherlock Holmes sans emotions, um, uh, and it just like goes on and on and on. Like Baba Yaga is a character in there, and it's all these public domain characters. He didn't have to make anyone up except for the dog. Um, it's a delightful story, and so Roger Zelazny walking away from that would own the the original characters that he created. That he would have a copyright in any of the original characters. He has a copyright in the literal book itself, like in the reproductions of the actual text. Um, and any sort of unique characterizations that he put on those characters. Um, he would have uh, a copyright in. Um, so he's got, a, he would probably arguably, if you did a Watson that was kind of bumbling because the Watson in his book is kind of clueless and just bumps into things all the time, um, you know, he might have a claim in that. So really in those kinds of situations, when you're adding, when you're doing something additive to something that's in the public domain, that addition is what you would have a copyright on or some kind of copyright interest in. There are limitations on what's going to be protectable. It needs to be something sufficiently detailed and delineated that it's really original. I mean, I don't. I hate saying original. It is the statutory word, but it that, that doesn't mean novel. It doesn't mean no one's done it before. But there has to be enough detail. There has to be enough there there for you to be protected. I would argue that clumsy Watson, clumsy is all you added. That's probably not, in my mind, sufficiently dedicated detailed sufficiently well delineated to really be anything protectable. If you build out, if you've added storyline, you know, whatever's happening with these lovely monsters, if we use um, Jim's example, if you've got Sherlock going against our aliens, make sure you're only using public domain Sherlock, but then the story that you're writing, that's yours. If you have made substantial additions to his character or to his experience, those would be yours. You don't get Sherlock. You don't get his world. If you notice, Jim very cleverly took him out of London and threw him into orbit. So what you're creating there is going to be yours. The more that you create, the more that's your work, not someone else's, the more rights you have to it. In 
but if it's if you're creating something from scratch, the basic same rules are going to apply. What you've created, what's detailed enough to be something that's not just a stereotype or a trope, that's going to be what you own. Same thing if you're using public domain, but instead of starting from zero, you're starting from here. The stuff you add on top is what you get to keep. And and, and just to add, right, that's um, uh, that's the reason why Sherlock Holmes with emotions uh, was not enough for them to keep control. Uh, if, 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 if I'm not mistaken, they lost those suits. Yes. The, 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 home, the, the, the Doyle estate lost those suits, and, and, and that's because just the, this, this simple notion of uh, uh, one be, a person, a character being more in touch with his emotions is, is, a, is, is, is a stock device. Yeah, that's it's not, not sufficient. Not that's actually a good segue, um, talk, just a super broad outline of character copyright. Mitch, you want to just do you do you want to take this awful question, which is what is character copyright? Character copyright is strange. Uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't arise naturally in the the words of the Copyright Act. It, it, it's this it's this Frankensteinian uh, creation. For the most part, it, um, you you don't infringe a copyright unless you create something that's that is in the 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 the, the, the lawyer term is substantially similar. Um, but then, as we often do in copyright, we get into these philosophical questions uh, about what does that mean? What is what is substantially similar? Um, We're awake. The the rough consensus in the courts is, um, you know, taking a character. You know, suppose again, supposing that all of Sherlock Holmes canon was was still under copyright, um, taking Sherlock Holmes and putting him in space. Um, what the court would look at is is that character substantially similar to the character that's that was this as 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 written in the novels, even if you ch even if you change you know the setting, the plot, and, and everything else. So, in reality, there isn't copyright in a character. The the, 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 law, the the law doesn't provide that. There is a character who happens to be substantially similar to a character who appears in a work that's copyrighted. That's 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 sort of the way that arises. But you wouldn't necessarily know that you know from listening to you know the rhetoric that that um, uh, movie houses and and then sort of sort of, sort of media in general put put out. They 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 treat it as something like like you know the, the ownership of a character, um, yeah. which in practical terms may yes, but 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 that's not that's not really how the law works. Um, and, you know, and that and that opens possibilities. That, that, that even 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 beyond the public domain, it, 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 it opens possibilities, particularly if it's a, not a well fleshed out character. I think I'm going to disagree a little bit with your characterization there. The statute doesn't mention characters per se, but any if you're writing a story, all of the elements of the story that are sufficiently delineated, they're original to you, are going to be protected. You can't just pluck Harry Potter out of the book and put her put him in your own story. You're okay. stealing elements. Harry Potter is trans. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, I had to. I'm legally out. You can't pluck him out of her books and put him in your own stories because you're stealing elements of her book. Just like you can't steal um, Hogwarts. You can't steal anything that's recognizable and original to another person's work and put it in your own work. Characters, there's a long string of cases about how well defined, so I kept using the words well delineated, your character has to be. If you just have a trope character, um, you know, Boy meets girl. Okay, yeah, they're both young, they're both stupid, they're both horny. Lovely, you got nothing. But if you start defining them up to someone more detailed, more recognizable, then you do have full copyright protection in even that part of your story. I'd just like to quickly point out the irony of the, uh, the company Disney that has been the most responsible for trying to keep works out of the public domain. Uh, got a lot of its success from mining the yeah. public domain. That's actually one of my No one knows to Disney what Disney yeah. did to the Brothers Grimm. And, and <laughs> I, I would also argue that Disney they are one Ooh. of the best examples of how to exploit the public domain because it, it is a very creative interpretation. Obviously, it's a format shift. It's from book to uh, movie, which, you know, in, in the Brothers Grimm case, they probably couldn't even conceive of movies when they were writing these. Um, there's a lot of art and design that goes into the characters. There's a lot of other creative things, obviously the songwriting, everything. I think that like 
that is a great way of making sure that your editions are protected. And in a lot of ways, um, they've made things so iconic that it's almost pulled stuff out of the public domain because you can't really think about that without thinking about their editions. Well, and that, and hang on one minute, and I'll go to your question. So this is actually was the next question I wanted to talk about was specifically about Disney and how much stuff that they have um, borrowed, leveraged, scooped up with a vacuum cleaner of myth, legend, the work of the Brothers Grimm, all these different sorts of works, and that they have now sort of created what is the icon for that, like, you know, Little Mermaid, you think about, um, you know, any... I, I often forget that yeah. Hans Christian Anderson's Little Mermaid didn't have a name. Yeah. Yeah. And she lived in agony the rest of her life. The original stories were, I mean, the Brothers Grimm were grim. very grim. I've read most of them in German, and boy, in high school when my German teacher started, uh, started assigning this, I'm like, wait, what? Rapunzel didn't get caught because the witch saw the prince in the tower with her. Rapunzel got caught because she started to show. That wasn't in the G-rated one I had read, but in high school I got a little bit more education. Yeah, there's a one of my one of my favorite internet memes recently is that says my life is a fairy tale, but it was written by a German. But all mood. I agree with your argument. What happened with DC and Marvel? They were in a story for the characters way beyond the original, right? And they didn't do anything against each other in that. Was it a mutual agreement or because we have characters coming up with one and then two popular, and I didn't control up with the other one. They always they were close. Yeah, just for, for future reference, for questions, you should probably go Please up to the mic because yeah. otherwise we don't get it. Um, and folks in the back probably can't hear yeah. it. Thank you, guys. I like you. Yeah. <laughs> You got lawyers up front. We'll always do it for you. It's fine. Yeah. I can drop kick in the skirt. It's got a lot. So uh, let me. Ask, I'll actually comment because I know a little bit about that. Um, so when you look at that, there was a lot of stuff stolen back and forth and ripped off and everything else. That's because every character, one of those characters, came from stuff that they were ripping off out of cult girls like Geist. Right now, it depends on how close do you get. There's a couple of things there that a you have to remember. All of them are in, I won't say all of them are in New York, like Superman came originally out of Cleveland. Yeah, there's, but all these folks knew each other, worked together, moved between the different houses a lot of the time. You know, we know the big names, but there's there was a lot of these guys that would do a run here, go do a run there, still happens today. So characters that go get created, if you look at how you create most superhero characters, they're fundamentally going to be based around certain tropes. They're not that complex. It's how you then execute beyond that. I mean, Superman and Shazam, you know, I, you get into their quote unquote, fundamentally the same character. Like you could say Superman and Homelander now, right? If you look at the boys. So I think there's a degree there of the bigger houses sort of agreeing not to mess with each other except when it was convenient. Now, I think the legality of that, because it comes down to, do you want to sue or not? So now I'll kind of throw this down to... And you're always yeah. going to be concerned if you're the one saying, okay, I'm going to sue them over this. You might want to look and see what of yours or what of theirs you've taken. And that sometimes keeps, I would say honest people honest, but in this case, perhaps it keeps dishonest people nonviolent um, out of litigation. If you're not, if you know that the counterclaim is going to be just as bad and I think that Jim's point about a lot of those characters, you know, okay, I wear tights and I'm strong. Well, okay, what actually delineates me? You can't own, I own tights and I, I wear tights and I'm strong. Once I add the S, once I add the backstory, once I add the little curl, if I'm in the mood, you know, each thing that I add, those, th those details that make the character recognizable, those are what are going to be protected. So if they just put someone else in red and blue and tights and a cape, you know, is that an infringement? Probably what it's infringing wasn't protected in the first place because it was just a trope, a strong guy in a cape. So it's when you have those definable details, that's what's going to make a difference. Now, I don't know if they actually stole the real character with the same name and threw him in someone else's book. At that point, yeah, you can call the litigators. There's, again, at, at, as my understanding of the early days of that industry, 
there was a lot of churning and not a lot of money and there weren't as many lawyers then as there are now. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is, is characters. So you'll often hear copyright lawyers refer to copyright as being thin. We never really say thick copyright, but we say thin, co mostly because thick copyright is just a cursed combination of words. Um, but we talk about having thin copyright on some things. Um, and that means, you know, it, it's reflective of this idea that the more embellished and the more distinctive something is from the rest of the field, the more protection it should have. And if something is like kind of mostly stock with like a layer of paint thrown on top of it, then maybe you get you get protection in as far as nobody's allowed to directly and literally and exactly copy it. But if they do something that's a little bit different, then they'll probably be fine. Um, one of the ways that this happens is just time. So the older a character is, the longer it's been around, the more that has been written with this character. You know, Batman now is incredibly comp. I mean, I have a good friend who will talk my ear off for an hour about Batman lore. Like, Batman has lore now. Um, Superman, when Superman was starting out, was has cape is strong. Um, and the rest of it sort of took some time and like a patina to build up. And so the other thing to keep in mind is like when these industries were very new, they really were working off of archetypes. And so, like, could they have sued? Probably, yeah, if they really wanted to, like, litigate at each other. But the, like, real value in these characters and the real protectability of them is something that built up over time. It, it, so Mickey is a really is an interesting example of that because he has no discernible personality. And what, what little he has has changed over time. If you watch uh, uh, Steamboat Willie, he's just kind of a jerk. He's like, torturing animals. The term and, is and, lovable and scam. Right. <laughs> kind of a jerk. Oh, he's also racist. Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, who, who, who in the Disney universe wasn't racist at some point? <laughs> and the one other thing I'll add to that is keep in mind, these guys were cranking out pulp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was yeah. stuff that was printed on the cheapest paper, wasn't expected to last long. And they were trying to build an industry. And the while for the most part those people that created that industry and and sort of built it from ground up recognized it was better to kind of just rip each other off and and have that friendly rivalry or not so friendly rivalry at times um but it was better to not blow up their burgeoning in you know their building industry versus yeah. They also, considering how fast they were putting stuff out and how little control there was at many points of it, they may not have noticed. It took collectors later to go back and say, wait, this guy who's in this panel shouldn't be in a Marvel book. He should be over here. In DC. They may not have even known. They, they were crossovers and stuff between the two properties. I just want to go back to the boys real quick, because uh, I think it is a special <laughs> case. So um, yeah. So um, in the case of the boys, they are explicitly ripping off archetypes to make commentary, satire, and parody. And that comedy, satire, and parody is directed at the thing that they are ripping off, which is very important for fair use. So it's almost like the the writers like visit a lab for creating fair use works and like, <laughs> you know, mixed all these things together. Um, and so that that's a, a special case. And did some shots at some other control zones. So you've been very patient, waiting to ask Thank a question you. for like three days. I'm nothing if not patient. Uh, so it was mentioned that um, corporate works have their um, their their ownership expired after I think 95 years. Mm -hmm. So for easy math, we'll go with Windows 2000 and imagined it was January 1, 2000, when it made its first public appearance. First of all, thousands of authors, one assumes, but sure. Um, what becomes public domain? Because I'm a software developer, the like quick and dirty explanation of software is that humans write software in like English words and letters, and they run it through a program called a compiler, and then a binary comes out, and that's what you ship to people on 45 floppy disks or whatever happened with Windows 2000. So what in 2095 is entering public domain? The quick answer is both source code and object code are copyrighted. Uh, and both will enter the public domain on January 1st, 2096. And it makes no sense that both are protected by copyright, but they are. Okay. Are they, is Microsoft like obliged to publish the software no. the source oh, no. or? They no. don't have to make it easy. They no. just can't sue you if you get it. Yeah. There's no obligation for them to disclose their source code. Mm. It just means that if you have it, you can use it. Software copyright is a land of contrasts. And complete it irrationality. Sense. It makes no sense at all. So, so presumably there's no legal means to acquire that source, though, right? 
Unless they publish it explicitly. So how much money do you have? There we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not enough is the answer. <laughs> so it was alluded to earlier in the panel that for the majority of cases, copyright law lasts too long uh, with the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. In your opinion, what would be a more reasonable length for the majority of cases of copyrighted material before entering the public domain? Uh, the original terms in the U.S. were 28 years, review, renewable for a second 28 years. That's pretty good. Yep. Yep. The argument against that, which I, I'm with Mitch on this generally, the argument against that is that I'm remembering to renew every 28 years creates an administrative burden both on the copyright office and a burden on the artist or the rights holder. Um, so any of you who remember uh, watching It's a Wonderful Life on repeat on Christmas Day, that was on repeat because it was in the public domain because somebody missed the renewal deadline. Um, and so that hit the public domain very early and it became a Christmas classic as a result. It was panned when it came out. It was like not a popular movie. The only reason we know about it is because it was, it was free programming when no one was staffing the TV stations. There, there, there are, are other rules really... for this, by the way. So we, we're, we're, we could be, we keep the term at its current too long state, but, but, but at some point the, the presumption shifts. And... Um, uh, it, it becomes safer and easier to use to use works that, that may still be in copyright. Um, there, there have been proposals for this over the years. And it, so, as a creator, let me let me speak to that side from my perspective. Being somebody, if I let's say, for example, I brought created something, character, story, all the rest of that, I bring that in. Um, if and again, the vast majority of stuff that we create today, because the amount of material created on an hourly basis that comes into copyright on the hourly basis is incomprehensible, and 99% of it will never be seen by anybody. This is much more about the what about the very small percentage, like Matt Denham, a friend of mine who's here, you know, started writing, was indie, got picked up, just got picked up by Ace. He is, you know, he is, they're about to pilot his TV show and everything else. If you happen to be somebody who hits, well, you know, if you come and say, well, 20 years, you get 20 years rights to your IP, and then it goes open to the public. Well, if, for example, now in, you know, think about The Simpsons. If that was to then enter the public domain, that would really blow up a property that's still on mm -hmm. running for whatever reason, but it's still on running and, and operating. So as a creator, I actually prefer the idea and like the idea of, okay, I'm dead plus a certain amount of time right. for my heirs. And protecting the heirs is something that is not obviously in the Constitution, but it's been part of the policy behind our Copyright Act since the beginning. It's not just the author, it's also the author's heirs that are supposed to be you know, protected and rewarded because again, we're trying to get people to write, we're trying to get people to create. And if as soon as they're dead or as, you know, 20 years after they've done it, there's no value to their work any longer, they're going to get a day job. Our public domain is going to be thin rather than useful. You've got to make it long enough to be a valuable incentive. And Congress has always recognized that caring for the heirs is part of that calculation. So I think that's wrong. Um, That's okay. This is me tossing a grenade. Uh, yeah, so no, that was not originally in the original Copyright Act. It was it was a renew. It was a set term with the ability to renew. Now you could have it renewed by your estate, but there was nothing in there about like guaranteed. Once you were dead, your your heirs have have a, a right to be making a, your you know a right to have your college paid for by your great grandfather having written a novel that like made it big once. Um, this has become a very complicated topic for a handful of reasons. Now. Like one of them, and not a small part of it, is that one is, you know, when you extend something past the life and you create an intergenerational entitlement, which is, you know, copyright, um, that's hard to walk back. Like it is very difficult to walk that back. The other part, um, and this I'm Iron Manning this argument, is that for a very long time, um, creative success in the entertainment industry was one of the few ways for authors of color to create intergenerational wealth. Um, and so this has become a very serious vehicle, especially among like black musicians, black authors, black artists, um, to actually create intergenerational wealth when a lot of other avenues were cut off for them, which has like lent an extra, very complex air to this debate. 
Um, even though, you know, I'm in an, in an, I'm generally with Mitch. I think these terms are way too long. I think you would have a hard, you'd be a little hard pressed to find somebody who doesn't think that they're way too long, even though we've got one sitting right next to me. Um, you don't have to look far. But yeah, it's it's a complicated debate, um, you know, and I'm at least of the opinion that there the externalities, the costs that that incredibly long term imposes on the rest of the system, especially on archival preservation, on the loss of knowledge, the loss of works, outweighs the benefits that accumulate to the very small, very, very small percentage of estates that are still making money off of something that was published 70 years plus ago. One more point on this, and then and, and a really good, and, and another thing. There is right, right. There is there there is a lot. Of, I think uh, value to the idea of at some shorter point, in some shorter term, evaluating whether something still has commercial value and and uh, or whether or is being commercially exploited. Now this gets complicated, and those complications themselves impose costs, but. Uh, if if the law recognized that we could win out that two percent of works that's that's you know like Mickey Mouse are still being exploited uh, nearly as a, a century after their creation, um, well, it clearly has you know, then, so, right? Then, then we you can't really, say we'd really be enriching the public domain. So so the only reason I'm gonna cut in here is we've only got about five minutes left, and I'll make sure everybody gets a chance to ask a question for the speed round, um, which means brevity. Oh. <laughs> Have fun. And you know with attorneys. They, by the by, the minute they still build. I'm just shoot the duck at you if you take too long. I'm going to make yeah. a very short point, which is that I kind of agree with everyone on this table. Uh, the The problem is, is that when you have a very long copyright term, you don't get the benefit of the public domain, which is that a lot of times we learn from each other, we build on each other's ideas, and so if you have strong fair use, that eases the the burden on a uh, copyright term that like they could be longer and it doesn't matter as much because there are more ways for us to use each other's ideas without getting sued ideas mm -hmm. are protected but then the more copyright the stronger the copyright the the harder it is and you get situations like which we won't jump into because it'll take too long but like blurred lines where we're having artists and artists over melodies and stuff like that and that creates a lot of pressure to have shorter copyright terms because we do need a, a culturally relevant, timely public domain that we can exploit. Okay, as a teacher, um, I've seen things where you know you get, make things for free for your classroom, decorations or free stickers for your kids or whatever, and companies like Disney will come after you if you have too much of it or whatever. Where is our safe space for that of what we can and can't do when we're not charging and we're just doing stuff like that? Because that could also apply to like swag at con and things like that that you're not charging for, you're not getting anything out of, you're just putting it out there as a free thing that you're enjoying. Thank you. <laughs> so, so that, yeah, like. that that comes from those that permission comes from mainly from fair use. Uh, fair use. Unfortunately, there are no safe harbors. It isn't like you can use. You, you 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 can make the copies so large, or you can use so many seconds of a video. There there there, there are no such hard. It's all high, higher risk, lower risk. Um, in nonprofit circumstances, educational circumstances, you, your risk is lower. Um, doesn't mean Disney won't come after you, uh, but it means they are because in this country, anyone can sue anyone for anything. Mm -hmm. What it means is they are less likely to come after you, and they and they are less likely to win if they do. If you can afford the attorneys. My husband and I are both musicians, and we had a simultaneously glorious and torturous time earlier this year composing original songs for a public domain script of Alice in Wonderland for a high school. I would now like to do that with Wonderful Life, mm -hmm. but I know that even though the movie is now public domain, the script may not be, and I can't find who owns the rights to the script. Any advice? Um, yeah, actually, you can actually, uh, there's a couple of sources that you could go to to get the script. Um, just grab me afterwards. And... Okay, thank you. Cool. Solving problems. Um, I was wondering um, if you knew anything about the uh, the Terra deck, mm -hmm. um, the, the 1909 mm -hmm. version. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the Rider Waite uh, Smith, I think it's called. And the, apparently the company that still owns that apparently colorized or enhanced the color it's been explained to me by my niece 
um, in the 70s, so they still own the copyright for it? They would only own what they added. So if they added brighter colors, they're going to own arguably the version with those brighter colors, but the underlying work would be in the public domain. Yeah. Okay. Get the one with the dimmer colors. And okay, they do because, everything with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she complains that there doesn't seem to be one like that. Mm -hmm. And she... Yeah, they mm -hmm. become harder. There are a couple of like they have so, yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So, any other questions? We got time for probably one more. You mentioned the clause from the Constitution. It's actually an IP clause for both patents and copyright. Why the hell is patents 20 years and copyright? Because it's the exact same idea of protecting the intellectual property and protecting the person to make it so they continue to make work for the betterment of society. The scope of patent protection is much, much thicker. You get many more rights with your patent than you do with your novel. I could, the exclusive rights that are guaranteed to the author under the Copyright Act do not keep, for instance, me from writing a very similar story. I can take the ideas out of it. I can take the facts out of it. I can use a lot of things out of a work that has a copyright. The patent, even if I invented a new process myself, if someone else has already registered it, I can't use it. And so that copyright prevents so much less use than patent does. Your patent term, since it's so much more valuable, if you will, there's so much more protection inherent in it. It's kind of a balancing act. Yeah. The other thing is that patents are, so the, the exact phrase in the Constitution is to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Um, if you're a copyright lawyer, that is tattooed in your brain. Um, the thing about patents is that there's a different trade-off as well, is that in order to get a patent, you have to disclose exactly what it is, um, and you have to, like, hand it out to the world, and so anybody can look at that and go, aha, that's how that works. Here's how I would make a cotton gin if I needed to make one. Um, and the idea behind patents, and, and this is sort of a, a little bit of an internal bias I think we have, uh, which is not to say that it's an incorrect one, but it is, there is a difference in how we treat practical inventions that are supposed to be instantiated and used in modern life versus creative works. Um, and the former, we really want people to see them and improve on them and accelerate the progress of change. And so the term ends up being shorter so that you can continue to riff on them and make new cottages. Also, the media and entertainment industries have better lobbyists. Uh, it's amazing what uh, being able to parade celebrities and movie stars in, in front of lawmakers will do. Yet the pharmaceutical. So I would actually push back against both of those comments. So. Oh, oh. <laughs> For one, um, uh, in talking with some patent attorneys, I have been told it is malpractice to write a patent that anyone can read and figure out how to do the thing. Mm -hmm. And there's actually been studies that show that uh, inventors rarely look at patents for inspiration or to learn how things work. Um, and then also, I think that the patent industry is, is definitely just as strong. Uh, the one thing, though, is, is the public interest factors are extremely different mm -hmm. with inventions. Um, a current technology for it to be relevant to the public domain to actually get that social benefit, it requires a lot more recent time. And also we're talking about a lot of things that have life or death implications yeah. when you're talking about drugs, when you're talking about safety technology, seat belts, and all these things. Like, an excellent point. Mm -hmm. and no so one's going to die yeah. without a novel. <laughs> That's you. So I think we we're up on time, and I was trying to pull something up, but I think we're up on time. I appreciate everybody coming in for the conversation. I want to thank my panelists. Would you guys like to let everybody know where you're going to be and how they can pay the attorneys? Or sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, this is actually my last panel. Yeah, I think this is my last one. Um, hallelujah. <laughs> I've had so very many of them. Um, we got a bunch of swag up here. Uh, you, you can come and read about how cosplay is not a crime. Uh, they got QR codes on the back. Um, that's another panel, Courtney. Uh, but yeah, thanks for coming. I will also have swag. Mm -hmm. And if you have uh, uh, questions for me, or, or uh, I am Mitch at EFF.org. If you have general legal questions, info at EFF.org. Yeah, and if you want to talk to me, I will be here because I have a panel after this and then I'm done.